Ruth chapter 2, continued, 2 of 2. And, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee, Ruth 2 4. Now for some unexplained reason, Boaz was detained from getting to his fields early in the morning. He was a prosperous man, and maybe he didn't have to be there early. But I judge by the character of the man that he was on top of every situation, and he probably had business that morning in Bethlehem. Perhaps he had to wait until the First National Bank of Bethlehem opened, so he could get the payroll for his workers. But whatever the reason may have been, he didn't get out into his field until a little later. Notice what he did when he got out there. He said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. That's capital speaking. And they responded, The Lord bless thee, and that's labor answering. Say, that doesn't sound like some of the labor leaders and capitalists of our day, does it? It doesn't sound like the steel workers or the steel owners either. Unfortunately, capital and labor both are very far from God today. Now, frankly, I am a poor preacher, and I'm not a capitalist. My dad was a working man. I remember him in overalls most of the time because he was a hard worker. I just can't sanction godless capitalism today. From listening to them, I get the impression that most of the labor leaders are very godless. I don't take sides today. I just wish that we could get something of real Christianity, the real born-again type, into this area. It would certainly help the relationship. You'd hear language like this. Capital, the Lord be with you. And then labor answering the Lord bless thee. My, what a marvelous capital-labor relationship existed there in the fields of Boaz. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this? Ruth 2 5. Now we have really come to the part of our story that is exciting. This little foreign girl by the name of Ruth, willing to accept poverty and ostracism and perpetual widowhood, is out in the field gleaning. By chance, she has gone into the fields of Boaz, the most acceptable bachelor in Bethlehem. I suppose that the mothers of marriageable daughters in Bethlehem, had given many a tea, or invited him over for a meal. They say the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, and I imagine many had tried that route. But somehow or other he hadn't been interested in the local girls. But then one day he goes into his fields, and he sees for the first time this little widow from Moab. And I tell you, he falls for her. Now our King James translation here is rather stilted. Don't misunderstand me, I still feel that the King James translation is our best for public use. Although the American Standard Version of 1901 is probably more accurate, it's very hard to improve on this King James. But there are places where I think we can bring it up to date, and this is such a place. What Boaz said here is not quite, whose damsel is this? may I just give you several very free translations? He says, well, where in the world has she been, that I haven't met her before? That's very free, as you can see. Or let me give it another way. Perhaps as accurate Hebrew as you can possibly get, could not be translated, but would sound like a Hebrew wolf whistle. He fell for this girl. This is love at first sight. And maybe you're wondering if I believe in love at first sight. May I say to you, I believe in it very strongly, I proposed to my wife on the second date we had. The reason I didn't propose to her on the first date, was because I didn't want her to think I was in any hurry. Now don't get any ideas if you're a young person. It was a year before we got married. We wanted to make sure. Yes, I believe in love at first sight, but I think love ought to be tested by quite a bit of time, before marriage takes place. Boaz had a case of love at first sight. This man really fell for Ruth, and this is romance in the fields of Boaz, if you please. And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab, Ruth 2 6. His foreman tells Boaz who she is, and implies, Why, you certainly wouldn't want to know her. She just came in the fields here, and I think he's halfway apologizing and assuring Boaz that he had nothing to do with her coming into the field. He explains, and she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came, and hath continued even from the morning until now, that she tarried a little in the house, Ruth 2 7. 
Although it's very clear to us, that Boaz has fallen for this little foreign girl, his superintendent didn't see that at first, and he seems quite apologetic. This Moabitish woman came out here and asked to glean, and I couldn't turn her down. After all, the Mosaic system permits her to come in here and glean, since she's poor, and a stranger. But he didn't need to be apologetic, because Boaz has fallen in love with this girl. And this reveals a great deal about Ruth, of course. It reveals that she certainly lived up to her name. As you'll remember, we did not attempt to translate Ruth into any English word, because I do not think there is any one word that will quite describe her. Ruth means beauty, personality, and we suggested the word glamour, but that word has been absolutely ruined by Hollywood, and by cheap literature today, so that I just don't know what word to use. But this scene reveals something of the attractiveness of this woman. What all the other girls and beauties of Bethlehem, had not been able to accomplish, this girl did, and she didn't even try at all. She had already taken her position as an outcast, and she did not expect any attention at all. You'll notice her surprise when she finds out, that she has attracted the attention of this man. Now after his superintendent has apologetically given him the information he wanted, notice the reaction of Boaz. He turns and addresses Ruth. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens, Ruth 2 8. Now let me pause and say, that this is strange language. Here is a man that honestly would not want the poor in his fields. The Mosaic law said he had to permit it. And I think Boaz was generous, but he just didn't put up a sign and say to the poor, come in and glean, and he didn't invite them in. But here is an occasion when he goes out of his way, to urge Ruth not to go into any other field to glean. I want you to glean in my field. Well now, is he interested or is he interested? Also, he adds, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them, have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels, and drink of that which the young men have drawn, Ruth 2 9. There are two things here that are very important. He not only invites her to stay in the field, but he also puts around her his cloak of protection. He says, I have now given orders that you can come into this field, and that you will not be hurt or harmed in any way. Frankly, in that day it was very dangerous for a woman in Ruth's position, a widow, a woman from Moab. She was likely to have insult upon insult heaped upon her. And not only that, but she would not be safe. And Boaz, recognizing that, immediately puts his cloak of protection around her. It was almost as unsafe on the roads of Bethlehem in that day, as it would be today, on the streets of our modern cities. One of my missionary friends from Africa put it like this, it is safer on the jungle trail in Africa, where I minister, than it is, on the streets of Los Angeles. Now that's what civilization has risen to, and especially this new civilization with its liberal approach to crime. It's the crybaby type that says that the poor criminal, is to be brought back into society and is to be reclaimed. May I say to you, the whole point, and we need to get back to it, is to punish the criminal. That was the purpose of putting one into prison. It wasn't intended to do anything else but to punish him. And how much reclaiming are they doing today? May I say to you, that type of thinking is almost a farce today. God knows this because he knows the human family, and he knows you and me. He knows that you and I today have an old nature, and until you and I come to Jesus Christ, we can't be reclaimed, my friend. Now will you notice Ruth's reaction to this very noble and generous gesture on the part of Boaz. Then she fell on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Ruth 2.10 When I first wrote my book, Ruth, The Romance of Redemption, I assumed and took the position, that here, Ruth was actually being either naive or a coquette, that she was playing it rather cleverly by asking, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Now, frankly, I can't hold that position any longer. She is not being that at all. You see, she had been properly warned and made aware of her situation, 
if she returned to Bethlehem with Naomi, and that's the reason the other woman of Moab, Orpah, didn't come. Orpah just wouldn't make the sacrifice. She was not willing to be a perpetual widow, and be poverty-stricken the rest of her life, and be ostracized besides. Therefore, she remained in the land of Moab. But Ruth came, realizing all of that. When she went out into the fields of Boaz, she never dreamed that anyone would ever take any notice of her. In fact, she expected that they would all turn their backs upon her, because the Jews at this time didn't have dealings with the Moabites. As we'll see later on, even the Mosaic law shut a Moabite out from the congregation of the Lord. The Moabites had a very bad beginning that's not very pretty to recount, and for that reason, they are given this very low position. But this little book of Ruth reveals something that is quite interesting. Racial barriers were broken down, and God is concerned and loves even those, who have upon them a stigma and a judgment. Such is the picture of you and me today. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5 8, and Paul says you just don't find love like that in this world today. Only God has a real concern for people. You just don't find love anywhere else like the love God shows for sinners. But here is an exhibition of it, and that's the reason Ruth says, why have I found grace in thine eyes? She's absolutely startled. She's a stranger, an outcast, and I think it's an honest, sincere question she's raising. She can't understand this breaking over of a racial barrier. Here is an interest that she did not expect. Now I can answer Ruth's question very easily. If she would just go home and look in a mirror, she'd see the reason. She's beautiful. She's lovely. She's attractive. She has everything that is desirable in a woman and a wife, and for that reason this man has fallen in love with her. I can answer her question. But there is a question I cannot answer. Why have I found grace in the eyes of God? Now don't tell me to go home and look in the mirror, because I've done that. Frankly, friend, the image is something that's not quite attractive. I don't see the answer in the mirror. But God has extended grace toward us. And there are those who consider the theme of the book of Ruth to be just that. The grace of God is exhibited here in the grace that was manifested to this woman. And I must concur to the extent that this is certainly a marvelous example of grace. You and I both can ask Ruth's question as we come to God, why have I found grace in thine eyes? We cannot find the answer within ourselves, we're not lovely, we're not beautiful to Him, we are not attractive, we do not have those qualities that God adores and that He rewards and respects. We're sinners, and we're in rebellion against God, and yet, in spite of all that, God loves us. That is one of the great truths of the Word of God. He demonstrated that love, because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He extended His grace to us. And, friend, that's the basis upon which He saves us today. He hasn't any other reason for saving us. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me, all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law, since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother, and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. Ruth 2 11. Probably the reason Boaz had not met Ruth when she accompanied Naomi back to the land, was that he was away on one of those innumerable campaigns, that were carried on during the times of the judges. You'll recall that Boaz could be described not only as a mighty man of wealth, but also as a mighty man of the law and a mighty man of war. Undoubtedly he was a soldier. So he evidently was out of town and, when he returned, he heard this buzzing about a widow who had come back with Naomi. The things they were saying about her were quite good. Now Bethlehem was evidently given over to gossip, as most places are, and they were gossiping about this foreign girl, but what they were saying was good, which was unusual. They were amazed at her. They said, imagine, this little foreign girl has come back, and she's true to her mother-in-law. She didn't desert her when she got here. She doesn't chase around after the men, and she is a wonderful person. Boaz just couldn't believe that in addition to all he had heard about her character, she was as attractive as she was. But now when he sees her and finds out that all of these qualities are wrapped up in one person, I'll tell you, that's the reason that he has fallen for her. Just listen to him as he realizes the tremendous sacrifice she has made. The Lord recompense thy work, 
and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust, Ruth 2 12. She had come to trust the Lord God. This is the reason she had left the land of Moab and made that radical decision. She had said that the God of Naomi would be her God. She had turned from idolatry to the living and true God. This woman has come to trust God, she was one of his children. Therefore this is the wonderful testimony that she had there in the land of Israel. And Boaz says, May a full reward be given to you. May you be recompensed for this decision. And if Boaz has anything to do with it, he's going to see that she gets a full reward, and he begins immediately to work toward that end. He's in love with her, friend, and he is going to redeem her. She needs to be redeemed.